Okay, hello everybody. Jacek Bartoszak here speaking strategy and future and with me is Nicholas Myers. Uh, uh, hi, Nick. Hi, Jacek. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Day two, war, Russia against Ukraine, which means we are, we are talking on Friday, the 25th of February at 4 p.m. Warsaw time, which is 5 p.m. Ukrainian time, Kiev time. And we will talk about the tactical and operational assessment of what has been going on so far. Uh, Nick, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jacek. So I mostly have details at the moment about progress on the first day. I'm going to walk through a couple of things with maps. Uh, but I, we've been watching a bit on uh, the developments that have gone on the second day, and we're going to catch up with as much as we can. And then we're going to do some degree of assessment as to how each side is doing. So what I got here is just a Google Earth map this time where I've been trying to plot all the events that I can track using uh, open source reading of just uh, aggregators of Twitter feeds, Ukrainian news wires, uh, random Russian information has come out. It's important to state here, typically I rely on Russian propaganda to get a decent view of what they think is going on, but Russian propaganda has been surprisingly quiet. Uh, very few updates coming from them. So I'm uh, mostly sticking with the Ukrainian side, which uh, does mean that some of the readings of where the battles are might be a little optimistic. But for all of these, uh, this is the date, this is the time at which this occurred by. So a number of them uh, suspect the actual strikes occurred sooner uh, than what I have. So what is uh, the markings that you have here is, uh, right. they are valid at what time of the, uh, of the combat? So what we are looking at here are the first two hours of the war between 0400 and 0600 hours, Kiev time yesterday morning, mm -hmm. red, circles represent a direct um for indirect fires from ground sources so uh, our grad strikes and other artillery mm -hmm. the orange represents air launched or cruise missile or uav uh, launched strikes in the rear so as you see here um perhaps the most interesting thing is that the first border post to be overrun is actually in sumi oblast in the far northeast of the country uh, and this occurs at 4.35 a.m. Uh, this is before Putin even begin, goes on to television in Moscow, which may have been a pre-recorded message, it's unclear, saying that the operation is going to begin. Uh, that occurs at 4.48 Kiev time, obviously an hour further ahead, uh, Moscow time. So even before that, there was starting to be some degree of motion in here. We also now know with certain, well, we knew at the time, but uh, the Ukrainians were noticing that the Russians were starting to spray paint all their tactical insignia on the armored vehicles the afternoon before the war began. And uh, US uh, leaders were stating that they believed the war was going to start before the sun came up uh, by, mid, by about midnight or 2 a.m. Uh, Ukraine time. So as the as it's starting to get a bit light, we get all these missile strikes hitting in all these orange areas in the rear. These are overwhelmingly air bases. Uh, a couple of them are depots, one or two are ports, uh, but it's primarily air bases that they are hitting. And then at the front area in particular, they, you can see there's a big concentration of strikes in the Kharkov, Kharkiv area, primarily against both border guard posts as well as air defense sites. So trying to do as much suppression at the front as, as possible. Um, and then this blue box here is the representation of the first sighting of Russian air forces over Ukraine uh, inside the area that's already inside over the Kramatorsk air base in uh, Donetsk Oblast. Uh, people may remember that in 2014, obviously, Kramatorsk was one of the main battlefields in the first phases of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. So this red obviously is the Donbass front line. It's been static for some time. Then we've got the introduction of a couple of wars in different areas. So we move into the next hour, the concentration of strikes decreases, uh, at least in terms of what I can find open source. So we give a, another additional set of strikes across most of the other uh, air bases and arms depots. Uh, there are a couple of air strikes specifically around uh, uh, Kramatorsk again. 
And finally, we start to get the major uh, movement into the country between 07 and 0800 hours. Uh, this is when you start to see all the uh, images of armored vehicles slamming through with the different border checkpoints. So the first ones that are augmenting the initial one from Sumi are coming in from Belarus and then from the tripod, which is actually a uh, border crossing right at that tripod, uh, all converging into Chernigov Oblast to go against Kiev itself. Most of the rest of the front, not too much information, but some interesting expansion of where they are going to strike with additional, with now hitting Borispil, the main international airport uh, in Kiev for international passengers. You've probably been there. I know I've been to that airport. And, and by the way, have you heard, because there were some reports that some Spetsnaz groups were trying to seize or at least disrupt the Borispil operations or, you know, seize it. There were some rumors like that. Have you confirmed it somewhere else? Just in the I opening not, hours of the conflict. I have not been able to confirm that, though I have seen those rumors as well. This probably does explain why the strike at Borisville came after the most other strikes, uh, if only because they were attempting to take control of it. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, when it didn't work, then they decided to take it out. Uh, but again, what's interesting from this, well, say it the first time. What's interesting from this perspective is that though the air bases were the main target that the Russians were going at, they did not succeed in stopping the Ukrainian Air Force from flying. For most of the day, you could see images of MiG-29s chasing after C-35s, uh, as incredible as that sounds, going on over Ukraine. And despite the fact the Ukrainian Air Force is in fairly bad shape, we, there were even rumors of defections to Romania in the early parts of the day. The defections or maybe because of the uh, destruction of the airstrip, they, they had to, to, to fly there or something. How would you? It could very well be just that. I've not been able to confirm any specific rumors, but the, the point being the Ukrainian Air Force is still operational, which I don't think anybody was seriously anticipating. Mm -hmm. uh, as we move on to the next hour, we see a second wave of missile strikes across the air bases and arms depots further. And to make those strikes were both the ballistic Iskander strikes and the uh, Calibre cruise missile strikes? This is a combination of Calibre UAV delivered uh, loitering munitions as well as uh, air delivered missiles. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm aware, there's only, there's only publicized specifically one ballistic missile strike that occurred about 3.30 and the afternoon, so 15, 26, I think it's reported at Kiev time, that uh, there were missiles being, ballistic missiles being fired from Belarus. I presume those were Iskandera. I did not get a firm confirmation of where they landed, but presumably in the Kiev area. So most of these are cruise missiles. Uh, a couple of them are just simply loitering munitions moving about. Uh, this one over here, just outside of Transnistria, seemed at the time to be coming from Transnistria itself. It's still not certain where that is, in fact is coming from. But also at this point, we get the major movement of Russian forces out of Crimea, uh, up towards Novohankova, which is where the uh, Soviet era water sluices to divert water from the Dnieper River down to the fairly arid Crimean Peninsula are. And uh, this is occurring across two fronts, one on this main axis here on the left. Uh, this one is primarily successful, but there are signs of resistance going on for the course of the day, as well as uh, one at Yenchivsk on the eastern side of the Isthmus, which appears to have bogged down for most of yesterday, or at least yesterday. For, for what reason? Um, for one thing, the accent, the Area that needs to be transversed is very narrow. So it's easy for the Ukrainians, well, relatively easy for the Ukrainians to set up uh, a decent defensive position. So it wasn't sufficiently suppressed by artillery fire in advance, I'm not sure. Uh, the Russians claimed that it had fallen by about 10 a.m. Um, so shortly after this map comes up. But the Ukrainians continued to report that they were resisting until well after 1400. So it's so would, would, you, would, you confirm the, would you confirm the allegations in, in that particular respect, two allegations by the Ukrainian side, that first of all, the Russians, for, for, you know, for the sake of quickness and rapidity, uh, and maybe an expectation that the Ukrainians will not be putting out the fight, they didn't 
execute too much of the long fires to suppress the, the, the enemy, which is weird for their operational school of you know, war, war fighting. And the second is that the, the Ukrainians managed to manipulate terrain in advance quite well in terms of mining and canalizing, which means that the Russians must stay close on the roads, which make them vulnerable to ATGMs, right, and, and other munitions. So how would you react to, to, to those two allegations? So I don't have full information on, on, on either of those, but I will say, oh, sorry, I don't have full information on the second one of those. Uh, I will say the first one does definitely seem to be the case. Uh, I was going to bring that up at length towards later on in our conversation, but honestly, it shocked me how long range non-contact strikes there were at the beginning of this war. I was anticipating probably in the range of a full day of doing these strikes before moving in. Um, obviously, my anticipation, as you'll recall, I, I didn't go public with it because I was still hesitant about it, but my thought was that this war was not going to happen this week. And my main reason for saying so was that Ukrainian situational awareness would be sufficiently high that there would be sufficient resistance to stop uh, you, the Russians being able to use maneuver as shock as they were well positioned to do. And that is, in fact, the case that we have seen. Uh, that's the only explanation I can think of for why the Russians started literally moving so early in this operation, uh, in some cases moving before the non-contact strikes were even reported, but on average moving about two hours afterward. Um, this is very much in contradiction to what the Russians do in most of their standard exercises, where they will be pretty busily pounding out things with uh, precision strikes uh, especially UAV directed strikes for a long period of time before finally using their maneuver forces to arrive uh, as a shock value to seize uh, operational objectives. So, so, so why, why a difference? You think that they ex didn't anticipate uh, resistance in, 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 in such extent? My suspicion here is that politics got the better of the timetable. Uh, I don't I, I can't say that for certain. We probably won't know anything definitively for at least a couple of days, more likely a couple of months or years when, when we start to get additional input out of this. But whatever it was, the Russians have seemed to have been fairly confident that if they actually decided to cross the border, the shock value would be sufficiently high that it would cause some degree of state collapse. But as we're going to observe in just a moment, in virtually all sections of the front, the Ukrainians have been quite successful at holding ground. Um, and it's not because of excessive preparations. In fact, uh, but as you start, as you can see on this map here, at, at this hour, we start, we see the battles of Senitsa Luhanska as well as Shastya restart. And both of those are pretty ma are not major, but uh, humiliating, at the very least, failures for the Russians to try to advance, as well as uh, their attempts to get into Mariupol over the course of yesterday. Uh, out there, the Ukrainians had actually properly prepared their the terrain for defenses by mining everything, uh, making sure that everybody was at full manpower and kind of stripping their rear forces uh, substantially. And as a result, the Donbass line is basically holding with very little difficulty since um, the air still doesn't seem all that concentrated. There's obviously increased artillery fire and there's the danger of an extension of the line to force them to, that will force them to be surrounded if Melitopol falls and the uh, Russians proceed further east out of Crimea. But still, the Donbass line is holding. Um, elsewhere though, even in places where there was remarkably little preparation, despite an obvious need to do so, especially the areas north of Kyiv, um, like the first armored brigade of the Ukrainian armed forces, which granted is one of their better brigades, and certainly their one of their heavier ones, is almost single-handedly holding the line against at least two, probably much more Russian brigades uh, coming from multiple angles out of Chernobyl right now, at least three different angles of attack coming at them. Now we're hearing about uh, two hours ago now that the Russians are claiming that that brigade has finally been surrounded, which means that it's probably on borrowed time at the moment. But it's still under that much pressure with practically no air support, that's pretty incredible for the fact that the Russians could not pull that off. Um, 
And that's also, that, that Chernigov front was also the first place where we started seeing serious reports of uh, the Ukrainians capturing a fair number of Russian POWs, most, many of whom are conscripts actually, which again is a surprise. We kept being told over the past couple of months that uh, this was a BTG buildup. Uh, if these are BTGs, and clearly the definition of a battalion tactical group is changing because conscripts don't belong in battalion tactical groups, that's more than half the point. Uh, you're supposed to be using all contractor forces to ensure very high capabilities uh, despite lack of manpower, but offset by higher firepower. So if that's the circumstance that we're looking at, then clearly the Russians do not have, to use an American term, don't have their varsity team out at the front, which raises other questions that we need to address at the end. But anyhow, as we continue the story, and I, I'm not going to bog us down too many more details. At this point, at between uh, uh, 0800 and 0900 hours, the battle in the Donbass really gets going. We see additional strikes coming out of Kharkiv. Uh, we see now the Russians are moving up to Genyashysk. Battles are expanding elsewhere in the Donbass. And now things start to get a bit muddled um, about this point around 1000 hours in that morning. because It's hard to gauge precisely where everybody is there is remarkably little imagery of the battles literally occurring. Uh, we just have a whole bunch of images of destroyed equipment at the in the aftermath of certain battles. That could be a sign that uh, certain cyber and electronic warfare there, uh, things are functioning at the front. Could just be that people have successfully evacuated away from the frontline battles. Um, but it's also notable that there has not been nearly as much cyber disruption as we would have expected. Uh, for most of yesterday, uh, Ukrainian government websites were functioning normally. There were a variety of different means to gain it, to gather information on what was going on in Ukraine. Today, it's gotten a bit dicier, uh, both on the Russian and the Ukrainian side, as uh, certain hacker groups have started to really uh, go after Russian internet infrastructure. So we're starting to lose a couple of information sources, but still, it's not nearly as dramatic as we would have expected. Uh, at any rate, though, According to be about 1100 uh, hours of time, the Russians have now established their front line. Nick, Nick if I may, and what yeah. the encounters, the, the battles, the combat, what does the combat look like at you know, the, 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 the early hours of this conflict? Is it fighting the columns, uh, the Russian columns from amb uh, ambushes, or is it uh, you know, front, front encounters? How, what is your take on that? So unfortunately, we don't have that much information on this so far. The scattered bits of information we do have being released by different regional commanders is that they were successfully using ATGMs to take out primarily columns of forces, uh, or else UAVs were successfully delivering strikes against munitions depots. What this means to me in, that the, in the initial fog of war is that this was the most effective way that they were able to use their firepower as opposed to the predominant way in which engagements occurred. So obviously you're a commander and you've scored some major victory as well as a whole bunch of moderate victories. You're gonna, you're gonna boast about the thing that you did really well at. So my suspicion is that ATGMs versus columns was where everything was most effective, where it wasn't necessarily the primary story going on for most of the day. Uh, where it becomes, a, where it be, how it might be the primary story of the day could be that the Russians, having failed to advance very far in any front, despite a pretty sizable buildup of forces in advance, uh, suggests that perhaps that was the signature way in which they were just unable to move forward. But for now, that's as much detail as we have. We're going to need to wait until some Ukrainian Ukrainian and Russian commanders are able to talk probably after the operation is over. So we covered in fog of war at the moment, but clearly the most effective means that both sides are reporting are these use of ADGMs against columns or UAVs against um, concentrations of forces. I think at one point there's a strike at uh, the Russian, uh, sorry, the Ukrainian tank base at uh, Krivi Rif right here in the Dnipropetrovsk Oblast. Um, that claimed that three UAVs managed to take out, I think, 17 tanks as they were all constituted at a particular point. So 
not not half bad, but still unconfirmed whether or not that's a normal engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, sorry, it's not more conclusive than otherwise. But here we see uh, this arrow moving up to the Dnieper River. This was the major tactical success that the Russians had yesterday, uh, breaking out into Kherson Oblast, uh, gaining access to the Dnieper River here, at least on the uh, left bank, and soon being able to take control of the hydroelectric plant and uh, most areas around it. There continues to be some instances of resistance in the rear for the remainder of the uh, morning, but this breaks down by about 1,500 hours is when we stop hearing reports of stuff happening behind the line. When we get to 1,300 hours, the big battle of yesterday kicks off at uh, Ostomil when the Russian air, when Russian air assaults that are delivered by helicopters from Belarus land at the Antonov airfield in the Kostomil uh, suburb of Kiev, only about 15 kilometers northwest of the city. Let me zoom into there, but you can see. Um, a very risky operation, isn't it? On day one. Very risky operation. Initially successful, uh, mostly because the, the fighting has not been at this point to here, has not been at this point yet. In fact, uh, the Ukrainians only confirm that the Russians are crossing the border from Belarus west of the Dnieper River only about 20 minutes before this battle starts being reported. Mm -hmm. so this whole side of the front is supposedly not active to this time, possibly de-emphasized so, to the point. So what do you think? What was the, uh, the idea behind the Russian actions with uh, respect to this airfield and coordination with the movement from the north? So we got a hint uh, a little a short while later that about uh, 1741, 1741 hours key of time, the Ukrainians report that the 76th Guards Air Assault Division is now moving. 18 uh, Il-76, a very large military transport aircraft from their main base at Pskov, seemingly to this air base to probably land an entire regiment of Russian VDV troops outside of the city and really start to enact the uh, surrounding of Kiev. Um, we see that within the next hour going on here, the Ukrainians actually repulse a separate air assault landing directly on the, the uh, dam area at the north end of the city, as well as the beginning of artillery strikes on the south side of the city. So they are really starting to uh, show that- Hold on, hold on, Nick. So there was another assault on the dam, on the, you know, dam, around the dam place, right? It appears that they were attempting to. And I'd say, I'd emphasize appears to because clearly it was not followed up on. Uh, what is definite, or at least seems definite from the reporting I've seen so far, that the Ukrainian air defense successfully took down uh, at least one helicopter, up to three, landing in this area, and that forced an abort to that mission. Mm -hmm. so, and this was 1450 hours. And how, how and how did that work? You know, in this early phase of the campaign, did the Ukrainians really have any troops in, in Kiev and surroundings, given you know the uh, thinning out of the forces to all those four theaters, you know, different axes of advances? So what is your assessment? Did, did... So I have not been able to see too much about how the literal forces around Kiev were distributed over the course of the day. Well, at least the beginning of the day. Later on, obviously, they're concentrating to retake Gustamel because they become aware of the fact that this is the critical decisive point uh, of at least the first day of the campaign. But uh, it does not seem that they got too distracted by all the impending doom that seems to be coming out of the Chernigov area. This may have something to do with the fact that the brigade up here is doing remarkably well, even after they introduce a third line of advance coming uh, uh, along this axis route here, somewhat uh, in the mid afternoon, sorry, early afternoon, to try to cut it off even further. So the Ukrainian brigade, this uh, elite brigade, remi reminding the number of it is holding, holding ground around Chernihiv area. In First armored brigade. First Armored Brigade, the elite one. Carver was mentioning this one, I guess. Yes, it's uh, the First Armored Brigade in the Ukrainian Armed Forces, probably one of their best brigades, perhaps the best brigade that's not the uh, air, it's not their own rapid assault forces. They're equivalent of the VDV, but they have a different name I can never remember. 
Um, but again, like I said, this today they are now surrounded, at least according to the Russians, and are probably going to be trying to fight their way back out. Mm -hmm. uh, running short of the stuff that I have on the maps, it's this time that they start launching the Iskander shot fires from Belarus. Over the course of the entire day, the battle in Kharkov continues with um, remarkably few coherent details other than repeated shelling of the city's suburbs. And remind people, Kharkov is the second largest city in Ukraine. It's a fairly significant location relative to the other relative to other places. So it's significant whatever happens there. And then by um, 1600 hours, we really start to see firstly a break, firstly just a total breakdown of Ukrainian defenses in the Southern Peninsula. But at the same time, the Russian attempt to breach the Dnieper River and cross over and start encircling the city of Kherson, uh, seemingly to try to take Nikolaev, which is the home of one of the major uh, shipbuilding industries, the former Soviet Union, and that Putin specifically called out in his Monday night speech. Um, that is repulsed, and the Ukrainians managed to retake the bridgehead at the bridge where they are fighting this one right here, this yellow line here. Mm -hmm. So as of the last I have heard, this is still the front line of that fight, but uh, the Ukrainian defenders that had been holding against a reported amphibious assault in this area were surrounded have not necessarily surrendered or been destroyed yet, but uh, are not in a good position. Uh, this line out here towards Militopol did eventually start to break through um, later on in the afternoon, though Militopol itself, as far as I have seen, has not fallen yet, though it is uh, in serious danger. Uh, I have also not been able to find any coherently good information about what exactly is happening in Odessa. It does seem that there was an amphibious landing there. I've not been able to confirm anything of the timetable of it yet, but it seems that it was quite early in the day. What is clear is that the Ukrainian military institutions there are still functioning, as we still do get information about resistance going on. And it appears that the fighting there is a lot more irregular than it has been in other places. So this is the, in Odessa in particular, is where I've been seeing a lot of um, ununiformed Spetsnaz type people trying to infiltrate Ukrainian military infrastructure and being repulsed at uh, great cost to whoever was on patrol that particular time. So it's unclear to me to what extent Odessa actually has fallen, though it certainly is under contestation um, and is probably at greater risk at the moment than Mikolaev is. But that's that's basically the situation we had at the end of the first day. Uh, so I don't have the full map drawn out here, but the front line, as you can see online now, is not terribly far off from where, at, at the end of the first day, it's not terribly far off from what you'd be able to find just by Googling it, which is that this whole section around uh, the Chernobyl power plant has been captured. It's difficult to hit back at Chernobyl because massive potential environmental damage if you happen to hit it for obvious reasons. Uh, the, Rush, the Ukrainians managed to retake Gostomel uh, late evening, um, major Ukrainian victory to stop the, the encirclement of Kiev, at least on the first day. Uh, and Chernigov, obviously, the line is basically held at where these arrows end. This section here expands a bit. Uh, all of these sections of the, uh, the border have now been overrun by Russian forces, but they have not advanced especially far into Russia. The city of Sumy itself is not under control. And then Kharkov, it doesn't appear, it continues to be claims that Kharkov's on risk of being surrounded. I think that that's possible, um, but we have not seen significant evidence of the Russians getting too far behind a Kharkov yet. And then on the Donbass, basically nothing has moved. The Ukrainian preparations seem to have worked as intended. There were very serious efforts to shell Mariupol into submission as well as infiltrate with a combination of um, irregular forces and uh, amphibious landings from behind. So that's, that section of the front is particularly hairy. What we're seeing this morning uh, is honestly not changing the dynamic too terribly as of yet. Uh, obviously, the most important point is that if that uh, brigade in Chernigov is surrounded and eventually is forced to surrender, 
then it's going to be the beginning of the division of forces defending Kiev itself in a manner that's probably going to result in the collapse of the city, possibly uh, later today. Uh, I would suspect that if it doesn't happen later today, it will happen by the end of this weekend. Uh, um, unless so the, the hinge, major turnaround. The hinge in the defense is the, uh, the behavior of uh, br uh, First Brigade, First Armor Brigade, right? In Chernihov area. If the First Armor Brigade manages to reestablish its line of communication back to Kiev and the other supply depots, I suspect that they will be able to hold that, well, maybe at least be able to delay it a while longer. What we don't know at this, one of my major concerns about the duration of this war right now is that though the initial Russian strikes seemed pretty ineffective at grounding the Ukrainian Air Force, as we would have anticipated, uh, the destruction of supply depots at the beginning suggests that even if the Ukrainians remain in fighting shape longer than we anticipated, uh, they're not going to be able to sustain the war for more than perhaps two weeks. And that probably longer than their tactical situation is going to hold out. Uh, if the Russians continue to just take places and be retaken back, this might just drag on for two straight weeks and then it's going to be an absolute bloodbath catastrophe for the Russians, but not really much less of one for the Ukrainians either. Um, but at the, as of right now, I do think that the speed with which Kiev collapses is probably dictated by whether or not the First Armored Brigade surrenders or is actually destroyed in the Chernigov area. Mm -hmm. and, and how would you react to those you know, claims that the uh, first, the Ukrainians retook the, the airfield to the uh, Antonov? And uh, today, according to the, the most recent reports, but still to be verified, the Russians uh, regained regained availability of this uh, air, uh, airfield so yes it's and I, do, do, do the, the open source intelligence is much more is much reduced in quantity this morning what's making this complicated which suggests that perhaps electronic warfare is being used a bit more a bit more loosely today but the report was that the ukrainians retook gustamel air for uh, gustamel air base or airport uh, sometime late last night or late yesterday afternoon. And this was justly one of the major victories that the Ukrainians were very proud of at the, at the end of the day yesterday. Uh, as of, as of um, 1600 hours or so uh, Kiev time, the Russian MOD spokesman uh, claimed that the Russians had regained control of that airfield. Now, again, it's hard for me to confirm it because there's just less information coming out today. But if it is taken uh, and it's now reopened for the VDE to start landing, then this is going to be a major problem for the next couple of hours of the defense. The Ukrainian MOD has already emphasized the two major ingress points to Kiev from the west. So this road up here and this road over here are still under their full control. So it's not like it's already the end, but uh, if they're now starting to be able to import as much artillery as they want to, then they should be able to start bombarding uh, whatever they whatever they want, beginning to really close the noose on Kiev itself. In addition to which, with the uh, Russian forces coming out of Belarus already at least halfway to, well, on their way, let's say, to this position, any Ukrainian defenders still in this area east of Chitomir are going to be under increasing pressure to break back in. Now, because the 25th Brigade, I, I remember the name, I think it's the 25th Brigade, is based in Chitomir itself, their supply line is not especially long. And so their ability to continue to harass that rear area may continue for some time. Uh, that would be if that fails, if they are, if this force up here is able to link up with the airfield that the Russians uh, supposedly now control again, then we should be probably at the end, nearing the end of at least the first phase of the war, where the capital is still under Ukrainian control. Mm -hmm. So, so you you think that the um, the Russians will not be trying to occupy Kiev and get into the uh, government uh, area? They will simply create a political blackmail by more threatening with the uh, long range fires and keeping up. I, 
I honestly, this is what I would have thought until maybe two days ago, but the recklessness with which the Russians have just been advancing towards these cities suggests that while I says, well, if they're smart, they would start by doing that. Uh, I'm fairly convinced they're actually going to go into the capital and do their own regime change as they see necessary. Um, it's, this has been a remarkably reckless operation. And I'm very interested to find out who is leading it. Because we have, I haven't seen any specific information about what the uh, high end of the C2 structure is here. But my increasing suspicion is that whoever's in charge has a bit more sense politically than he does operationally. Because this has just been, by Russia's own standards, a very sloppily executed large-scale operation in which there's been remarkably little of the traditional cleverness that we, we see when they're going to do something big. Um, Would you expand on that? What, what does this mean? So, I mean, we'll begin with the fact that, that, as I've already mentioned, the maneuvers began very soon into the war. And not only just maneuvers, but maneuvers apparently with conscript manpower, now, this could mean a couple of things, but let's start with, like, this is the obvious, let's start with the obvious one that this was the plan all along. What this suggests is that unless they, what this suggests, honestly, is that the Russians thought they were going to play World War II Part Two and actually have fun with the big red arrows crossing over Ukraine and cutting things off and causing precipitate state collapse. Uh, I give Moscow a bit more credit than that, typically. Uh, this is why I'm kind of shocked at just how shoddy this is. Um, I would have expected that the Russians would have started with a very long series of non-contact strikes to take out all of the military positions, however long that took. On, on the understanding that the Ukrainians can't easily counterattack onto Russian territory without risk of very, very serious escalation. And honestly, Zelensky was already in a pretty difficult position as it was before Thursday of needing to, needing to explain why he couldn't attack the Donbass more, more than he previously was, despite the fact that it was now being declared not Ukrainian territory unilaterally by an external force. Uh, now, Zelensky's position, position seems quite strong, even if he's not necessarily doing the greatest of all actions. Uh, I've, I, for one, think that Zelensky has been doing as best as could be hoped for under the very trying circumstances. But pretty much any of that claim of there being political difficulties in Kiev for backing the government has evaporated. We've seen large lines of people trying to be recruited into the Ukrainian territorial defense, uh, which even if that ultimately doesn't make much tactical operational difference, does show that there is a lot of willingness to be a part of hypothetical insurgency after the Russians get in. Now, the bad news in all of this, I mean, there's bad news and there's very bad news, basically how I see it, is even if this is just a poorly planned Russian operation, I don't see much chance of the Russians losing it because they can continue to just dump more forces into this, the same way that in 2008 in Georgia, they made plenty of tactical mistakes, but they could just add more guys and eventually it was going to be fixed. On top of which, Kiev is simply not very far away from the border. Sooner or later, it's going to be encircled and collapse. Um, we can talk about... Can how, how, how about this, you know, what do you think about giving the weapons to civilians that is happening now, you know, 18,000 18, rifles, how does it play, you know, in, in the modern warfare, in, you know, in sort of this expectations that we have? And, so and, the, the, and the second question, hold on. And the second question is, uh, you know, under the disguise, under the guise of the night, couldn't the Ukrainians withdraw some troops from the front lines and just de deploy to Kiev just to consolidate defense? There are rumors like that from civilians on Twitter that uh, you know there's plenty of regular troops and plenty of volunteers with weapons and it's going to be a nightmare you know hell for russians so what how would you react to that so firstly throughout the entire war since 2014 manpower has never been ukraine's problem 
Um, there has been difficulties with administrative capacity, administrative running of the manpower. There's been difficulties making sure the pay is sufficient. There's been difficulty making sure the training was sufficiently competent and that equipment got to the correct places. But in terms of enthusiasm for having, for, for joining a defense against Russian aggression, this has not been Ukraine's problem. So if they have more small arms being distributed to more people, this does alleviate the problem of the units being too widely dispersed in terms of uh, being present. And I strongly suspect that that's not going to be Ukraine's issue to the end. The difficulty, and especially when you're talking about an urban campaign, I think it's going to have, um, there will be certain advantages the Ukrainians will hold if, it's, if the people are defending the city of Kyiv itself. The difficulty, though, is that the Russians, sooner or later, they can surround Kyiv, can stop advancing and just wait for the city to run out of food, honestly, or cut off its electricity, or make sure that there's just panic and increasing um, agitation going on in there. They don't even necessarily need that much propaganda. Uh, we know that when you have high enthusiasm, uh, the in over our overwhelming feeling from the enthusiastic is a will to fight. And if you deny them that keep it, you deny them that opportunity, this rapidly turns into maniac depression, the longstanding observation in the history of warfare. So my, my gut feeling on this is that um, having more people with guns is certainly not going to hurt in the very short term. And the Russian actions to date suggest that they will have an opportunity to do it because the Russians are honestly not being very smart about this. So perhaps they will have their chance to shoot up as many people coming into the city as they want to. But again, that's why I didn't think this war was going to happen the way it was in the first place. Everybody is now following the script that they've been able to practice in their own heads for several months now. So on the one hand, we've, we've, we've got that. But on the other, if the Russians control all the access points to the capital city, then the government either has to move out, which it could. Uh, I, strategically, it's uh, difficult to say how you would do that without uh, causing pretty severe structural damage to Ukrainian identity, uh, the will to fight. Um, or the government is going to have to just stay in there and sink with the ship. So we, we will see what the Russians decide. And I'm afraid we're going to know what the Russians are going to decide within 48 hours now, possibly within 12. But we'll don't mm -hmm. overestimate things. This and and how, how would you assess that the Russians decided like three hours ago also move along the new axis of operation towards Ruvne from Belarus itself, closer to the post border, and with the pot pot potential, you know, sort of the uh, turn to Lvov. So how would you assess this move? So this one, I have not seen clear evidence that this actually happened. What is true is that the uh, Russian forces that were exercising in the Brest area of Southwest Belarus did move to the Ukrainian border. And there also have been non-contact strikes against targets in the uh, Lutsk, in Rivna, as well as in Ivano-Frankivsk. So all across Western Ukraine, where perhaps we weren't expecting as much of an operation. Uh, there were also reports coming on along in Telegram saying that the Russians had in fact crossed the border and were now crossed the border at this point, and we're now uh, moving towards uh, Lviv, Ukrainian Lviv and Polish and Russian. Uh, potentially encircling the entire country. Uh, as far as the last I heard, the Ukrainian general staff was saying that they have not crossed there, but they have put in uh, mining and other uh, defensive preparations in the Volin Oblast, the far northwest of Ukraine, so that they're supposedly uh, ready for any attack that's coming in from there. But if we assume that the Russians and, and potentially Belarusians are advancing at that point, then this does open a couple of primarily political questions uh, because this does really open 
open the floodgates as to where are all of the people fleeing the uh, Russian occupation on coming into the eastern part of the country going to go. And if suddenly the far west of Ukraine is being occupied, even if only temporarily, uh, this is going to drive a lot of that traffic south. That's that's for certain. So away from Poland, more towards Romania and Moldova. Um, and also it just it creates some pretty serious security concerns for Poland, obviously, since we're now talking about both of the traditional geographic gates into uh, Poland from the east. So the Subcarpathian Gate, as well as the Smolensk Gate that we've been talking about for the past couple of years, as being under Russian, some form of Russian control. I say some form. Because if the Russians have decided that they're going to occupy the entire country of Ukraine, then I think Poland's pretty darn safe. Uh, you, Western Ukraine will be in total insurgency. All you got to do is a bare minimum job of arming those guys, and the Russians will lose everything. So if they're that stupid, then honestly, we can pack up and go home. But I don't think they're that stupid. Or rather, we as, we as intellectuals can pack up and go home. We just have to now move into a much bloodier fight of how to arm all of these people. Um, but still, if the Russians are now setting up a means of allowing themselves rotational access here, or possibly even closed cities where they're not going to bother anybody outside of them, but they have like a radar or a potential uh, small maneuver base in the area, similar to the uh, Soviet uh, units in Poland back during the Warsaw Pact era, where it's sort of closed cities in certain areas, as opposed to actually in Poland proper then that does start to create some long-term concerns. What I'm seeing so far on where I think the Russian end game is going here at the strategic level actually is worth bringing up this specific point though. I mentioned earlier that there are four industries that Putin called out on, in his Monday night speech about demonstrations of what the Ukrainians were specifically letting down at the end of the Soviet Union. And those four industries are the Antonov aircraft manufacturing in Kyiv, um, Yuzhmash, the missile people in uh, Dnipro, the uh, Black Sea shipbuilders in Nikolaev, and then a steelworks in Kremenchuk. So I would suggest that those four places are among those that he wants some form of control over, whether it's direct or indirect, we'll find out. My suspicion is it's going to be more indirect than otherwise, but possibly, but probably including uh, some form of Russian occupation, whatever polity is coming in those places. In addition to which, Odessa and uh, Kharkiv both strike me as especially high priority Russian targets. Uh, Odessa, because it's uh, probably the most Russophilic part of Ukraine that's still part of Ukraine, or at least was until very recently. And Kharkov, because in addition to being a large city, has a whole bunch of uh, military, um, has a whole bunch of military production facilities. Including the very tank, tank production facilities. Tank production, especially. Um, so I don't think that we're going towards annexations. I do think that we are going to large scale dismemberment of Ukraine. If the country of Ukraine survives this, it's going to be so heavily confederalized that the different constituent parts of it uh, will be able to come up with their own separate arrangements with Russia for Russian forces to be there. So, or at least in emergency situations. So my expectation is that if we've already sliced off Donetsk and Luhansk as their own countries, then we're probably going to end up seeing at least four more countries uh, emerging, probably in Novorossiya for the area from Odessa out to Donetsk, possibly even two of them, uh, as well as an area for Kharkov itself, the area around Kiev becoming the new proper Ukraine, uh, much reduced in compliance with Putin's very strong hatred of Lenin's decisions, apparently. Um, as then probably the Western part of Ukraine being sliced off as something probably called Galicia that he's probably going to take the least interest in, maybe even uh, consent to letting it join NATO, we'll find out. But Galicia is sort of an economic basket case of its own, in its own right. So 
So I don't think Russians have too much of a long-term interest in maintaining control over it. Probably would prefer it to stay neutral, but understand that we probably can't release it forever. So so coming back to going the here, operational, he, operational yes. dimension, you know, the, the, the bulk of the Ukrainian forces are either in the Donbass, in the Kharkov area, and generally east of the Dnieper River. So, you know, how to consolidate the defense line, you know, and the, the, to, to move back behind the Dnieper and just to the rescue of Kiev, what to do, you know, in terms, because, you know, in order also to calibrate the cascading morale issue, how would you play this game? It's, you know, it's, uh, it's 5 p.m. Kiev time, day two, what your orders would be, Nick? So the difficulty in calling a general retreat to west of the Dnieper, if you are Ukraine at any point in history, is that the area right bank Ukraine is prime for an offensive. It is very, very open terrain, very, very few canalization options, unlike um, left bank Ukraine, which the Ukrainians have successfully used to their advantage, especially in the defense of uh, Kharkiv. Sep keeping it separate from the defense of the Sumy and Chernigov areas so far. In addition to which, with the forces at the front, especially in the Donbas area, so comprising so much of a proportion of overarching Ukrainian strength, pulling those forces out, especially where the preparations for defense are by far the best that the Ukrainians have, would be a huge morale loss. Um, and, move, and honestly, moving back to an area that's going to be harder to defend, because if the Dnieper River is breached and the Russians manage to hold a bridgehead anywhere and keep getting supplies into that position, almost at any point between, between Kherson itself and Kyiv, it's not difficult to sustain a large-scale uh, offensive into that area, or at the very least continue to encircle the enemy, the enemy forces. Um, over and over again. This is more or less how Hitler's original invasion of Ukraine uh, succeeded so quickly. Some people have been saying, oh, Hitler needed 30 whole, 30 whole days to occupy what's now Ukraine. Why should we be concerned about the Russians' inability to do it in just one? And, and I would say that um, Hitler started a lot farther away from the center of Ukraine than the Russians are. Uh, he also had immediate access to the most open portions of Ukraine. You just think about that as a country the size of Germany relative to Russia, trying to take over this region in just 30 days is pretty spectacular. But a lot of that is to do with the fact that in addition to uh, the Soviet military wildly underperforming in the early phases of the war, the initial terrain that they were crossing was very favorable to offensive tactics. So, it's, in my opinion, it would be extremely difficult for the Ukrainians to regroup effectively unless they were trying to do a full on retreat to uh, key, basically the area between Kiev and Venetia and everything west of that. And that too would be such a traumatic defeat that I don't know precisely how that state would continue to survive, especially since the western part of Ukraine. Is very is not the majority population center of the country. In fact, uh, other than Kyiv itself, there are no uh, none of the cities out there are in the top of the Ukrainian list of uh, population centers, except to it, except Lviv. And Lviv itself is only, I think, number eight. I'd have to I'd have to look up more precisely where it is, but it's remarkably low. Um, so, if I were in charge at the moment, the most important thing, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult, it's quite difficult to say. The most important thing at the moment is to ensure that uh, the continuity that they have managed to preserve thus far continues. And if the slog continues at the rate that we saw yesterday, I do think that the civic unrest in Russia is actually going to be more unsustainable than the civic unrest in Ukraine. I don't know if we're even close to uh, liberal protesters in Moscow and St. Petersburg being able to do something that's going to politically change the calculus in Russia. 
But I do think that we are closer to that than we are closer to Ukraine going into full state collapse under the current circumstances. Mm. If that continuity is broken, I, the first armored brigade begins to fall and Kiev is now being regularly shelled, that whole logic reverses. Um, because as soon as you're talking about a city that's starving under artillery fire, probably without connections to the outside world of virtually any variety, then we are entering into a very different mindset of just about anything to make the suffering stop it becomes a lot more uh, politically palatable. So the most important thing under those circumstances is to make sure that that uh, continuity doesn't end. Um, from professional standpoint, I think that that means that as we've been worried for some time, without Western support in the forms of actually holding back Russian movements, Ukraine is doomed, not necessarily today, not necessarily this weekend, probably this weekend, but not necessarily, but doomed if Putin doesn't change his mind very, very soon. You know, and the last question before we end, Given you know the uh, the challenges that Poland is going to face in fielding the force, what are the the observations so far in terms of the warfare? Uh, you know, what deficits uh, Ukrainians have had that could have been addressed or should have been addressed, uh, like maybe more manpads or different other organization or other way of manipulating the terrain. With you know, especially with this observation with respect to Poland and the Polish armed forces that you know well, Nick, with, we were doing all this the new uh, Poland's new model army concept. So, how does that tune in with the uh, with the new model army? You know, with with the Polish sort of requirements of the, of, of Poland's defense. So this is the main work that we're going to have to do over the next couple of months. And at the moment, without much frontline knowledge of what's, what's actually the primary means of engagement by both sides, it's hard to make a large scale conclusion. Honestly, the biggest possibility I see looming here is that the Russians may very well be holding back their highest, their most highly trained forces as a preventative for NATO potentially attacking Belarus right now. And therefore, part of the reason why we're seeing such inept um, operational art at the front is because they're not actually doing an overwhelming strategy uh, and are trying to conserve their strength for if NATO is coming in after NATO is in fact going to intervene. If that is the case, and I emphasize if because it's certain we don't know that for sure, and that's just me speculating at the moment. Then we will not have that luxury if the Russians are attacking Poland, because they are going to assume that NATO in some variety is going to be doing something. Uh, there will be a certain degree of pulling back of uh, longer range strategic forces, but that's that's only to be expected against a non-nuclear country like Poland. What I think we can say for certain is that judging by the inability of the Russian Air Force to dominate the skies here, uh, at least so far, if you are able to similarly contest that airspace long enough, then we don't see rapid collapse of the front lines as we were sort of expect, well, not me personally, but as many were expecting uh, the Ukrainians would do if this mighty Russian force that had been assembled around it for four months had actually fallen in on it. Um, but remember the Ukrainian air force, such as has been able to fly is primarily composed of air superiority fighters and not uh, fighter bombers like the Polish air forces. So to a certain extent, they are optimized for that sort of situation. I, I don't know, I'm honestly stunned that we're talking about the Ukrainian Air Force at all, but here we are. Here we are. And they still yeah, are you, you know, what struck me, Nick, is I, I'm seeing all those photos of the columns of the Russian tanks and armored personal vehicles and stuff, you know. If you had like, you know, basic uh, air 
airstrike capabilities or even you know massive drone capabilities you could decimate those you know those vehicles on the road and they are packed like you know like herrings in, in in the tin in the can so or you know coordinating long-range fires or something because apparently russians are moving in columns to quickly move forward and it's a vulnerability yes uh, correct and if the Russians were attacking Poland in the same way that they're attacking Ukraine, then I would say that UAV and uh, UAV and helicopter-borne munitions would be easily triumphant over, uh, would easily reduce the scale of the Russian threat to something that Poland could easily handle, or rather, Poland could conceivably handle. So the whole demographic uh, divide would be more or less nullified by this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that the Russians would be using the same tactic tactics against Poland that they are currently using against Ukraine. But I also thought that they were smarter than what they're currently doing in Ukraine until yesterday either. So I might just be completely overestimating the Russian capabilities. The other, op the other possibility is the Russians want me to think that I've been overestimating their capabilities so that if, when they eventually go after NATO, we'll actually be shocked at how much better they are than what it appears to be right now. Because um, I think on specifically that note, if Russia were, if Ukraine were a NATO member, even if Ukrainian capabilities are not necessarily higher, but if Ukraine were a NATO member and it had a certain number of European or American attack helicopters and UAVs based on its territory. Like this, this war would be going infinitely worse for the Russians. We wouldn't be talking about a couple of hundred dead so far. We would be talking about uh, the obliteration of multiple regiments and possibly several brigades by this point. Uh, and that's, that would be singularly catastrophic to, to date. So on that front, I think it's quite clear that we do need to seriously invest in uh, loitering munitions, the variety that the Azerbaijanis and Turks took great advantage of in the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war. Because uh, clearly the Ukrainians did not have enough of them in order, to, in order to turn the tide dramatically. Perhaps they'll even manage to turn the tide in the next couple of days. But what I'm seeing so far is the Russians are just going to continue to surge into a couple of strategic points uh, until they can finally force Kiev into submission. Okay, Nick. I, I, you know, we will have a chance to talk more about it, maybe in part two. But so far, let's put an end to, you know, to our podcast. Uh, Nicholas Meyer, Jacek Bartosiak, Strategy and Future, we have been discussing the opening salvos, opening maneuvers in this war between Ukraine and Russia as of uh, Friday, 25th of February, 2022. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have better news for you. We'll see what happens next. Take care. Goodbye.